exploded. And if this other one that they're looking at now turns out to be something, it appears that it was meant for this building to come down, to be leveled, because of the uh, amount of power that could have gone off. Only one explosion, it was obviously tragic enough, but there were more bombs set to go off, according to ATF officials. It's been about five hours now since that first explosion occurred, almost five hours exactly. Uh, you probably, if you were in bed at the time that it uh, rattled you around, you looked at the alarm clock, you'll remember the time, and you will certainly now remember April 19th, 1995. But five hours since, and uh, because of these renewed concerns about new devices, five hours in, they are still really not able to get the uh, rescue effort into full swing. Been listening to Mike McCurry, uh, President Clinton's spokesperson at the White House. Apparently, at this point, we know a little bit more than yep. the White House does because we have been able to confirm that it was a car explosion. Uh, that word coming to us from Mayor Ron Norick earlier: 1,200 pounds of explosives parked out in front of the federal building. And ATF has confirmed that as well. Devin, we're getting more word on that car bomb now. Let me just read this straight from the wire. You talked about it a minute ago. The head of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms now says it appears it was a car bomb with as much as 1,200 pounds of explosives packed inside. 1,200 pounds of explosives packed inside that car bomb in front of the federal building. We heard earlier off the wire that from the governor that some of the fatalities were outside and across the street from the building. Now it all makes sense because the bomb was parked outside in a car. We've now moved from three bombs inside the building to one bomb with as much as 1,200 pounds of explosive par parked outside the building. The government official at the ATF will later change this to a rider truck in order to accommodate a larger supply of explosives than 1,200 pounds because that small amount of charge could not do the vast damage done to the Murrah building. But the steady escalation of the amount of explosives on the street and the invention of a bright yellow truck doesn't solve the problems the ATF officials and the obliging media representatives are dealing with. Such a car or truck bomb simply couldn't have taken out those support columns of the federal building. At the World Trade Center bombing in New York, the truck bomb was even larger than the final invention of the ATF at Oklahoma City, and the Trade Center bomb was parked in the garage right next to a support column. Yet all the Trade Center support columns remained intact. Moreover, the explosive force of any bomb falls off at the inverse cube of the distance from the bomb. The so-called Ryder truck bomb was parked outside the federal building. Now, this may all make sense to that reporter, but it makes no sense at all to anyone with a little time to make comparisons and to do some honest reflection. Now, Dr. Randall Heather is with us. He's a terrorism expert. Uh, Doctor, we are just shocked that this would happen here in the heartland of America. Should we be shocked about a car bomb in Oklahoma City? Well, any place you have a federal building, uh, you have a target. But that's the question everybody has right now. Why here? Why Oklahoma City? And and uh, you find out by finding why that building. I don't think it's I don't think it's material that it was in Oklahoma City. It's really the building. The building could have been in any city in the United States. The question is why that building. And was it Waco? Uh, is it the uh, Nation of Islam? We should find out an awful lot uh, when the bombs are taken apart. I think it was a, a great stroke of luck. As you're mentioning, it's hard to talk about luck on a day like today in Oklahoma City. But it was a great stroke of luck that we actually have got diffused bombs. It's through the bomb material that we will be able to track down uh, who committed this atrocity. All right, Dr. Randall Heather, a terrorism expert, we appreciate your time and your thoughts today, and I assume that we will be speaking with you again here in the hours and days to come. Dr. Heather spoke of a great stroke of luck. There was even a trace of a smile as he said this. In the authorities' possession of an entire defused explosive device that would lead them to the terrorists responsible for this tragedy. Heather said this was of great importance, a tremendous asset. Why haven't we heard more of this invaluable resource? Why is it that later media output speaks only of a single fertilizer bomb with no further revelations about the other bombs? 
The anchor said he was sure the public would be hearing more from this expert on terrorism, Dr. Randall Heather. Well, we haven't heard anything from him since. Is it because what he said cannot be made to fit the scenario created for us by the FBI, the ATF, Janet Reno, Bill Clinton, and the horde of media jackals who act as conduits for their misinformation? Well, we okay. heard earlier you, from uh, Dr. Heather who told us that the fact that they were able to find some yeah. of these devices undetonated is certainly going to help in their investigation. So let's go down now to Suzanne Steely. Suzanne? Devin, I got out of Chopper 4 just a few minutes ago and got really the first aerial look at this building. Of course, from this side, you can see the scope of the devastation, but you can't really see how much of the building is affected. Well, from the air, I could see that there, practically a third of it is blown away and that the worst of the damage is on the east side where there's a little pocket where it seems like the force of the explosion hit and half the building there is gone. When you look at the building, as, as we've heard from so many people who've been in there, it basically Basically, some of the floors have just crashed together. I mean, there are some points where you just literally can't get in at all. And then from Chopper 4, at some particular points, we could see all the way through the building. That's the force of the explosion. It just blew out all the walls and everything inside. Notice but this reporter's language. The explosion blew out all the walls and everything inside. She didn't say the walls were blown in or that everything inside was blown further in. They were all blown out. This report, which came early in the ordeal, is consistent with other journalists' news stories. The May 1st edition of Newsweek, on pages 45, 44, and 57, carried illustrations of that devastation with reports that parts of the Murrah building were blown out, not in, showing parts of the Murrah building that were blown directly across the street into the facade of the Journal Record building. It's clearly a physical impossibility for a bomb in a car or a truck to blow parts of the federal building out, making a path directly across the parking site of that car or truck and hitting the journal record building. However, explosives inside the Murrah building would have created just such a pattern of destruction. Further corroboration of the inside nature of this terrorist work may be seen in the May 1st edition of Time magazine, which details the experience of Candy Avey, who had just parked her car outside the building and was headed for the Social Security office. When she was blown back, wrapped around the parking meter, her face hit the car. Now, she was blown back, away from the building, rather than toward it, as would have been the case had the explosion come from the street in front of the building. Note these large pieces of debris that were thrown all the way across the street from the Murrah building. Uh, that we have here, you can see the sheriff's uh, bomb squad. These people have been obviously very, very busy today. They've just pulled up. They're continuing to stay in the area. And uh, as we have more information, we'll bring it to you. Back to you guys. Where has all this information gone? How did these many reports and all this evidence of an explosion and explosives within the building become condensed into a single fertilizer bomb located in a vehicle on the street outside. The next segment of this tape was extracted from an Austin, Texas public access cable TV interview with the premier explosive expert, General Benton K. Parton. Remarkably, the pronouncements of General Parton and similar statements of other top experts in the field have either been underplayed or altogether neglected by the media. Although this segment has marginal technical quality, it accurately presents the analysis by explosives expert, General Parton. Uh, General Pardon, would you explain to us a little bit about your career in the United States Air Force? I was in the Air Force 31 years, active duty, <clears throat> and I spent 25 years in research and development. Uh, most of that was in the weapons area. I had graduate training in armament engineering. <clears throat> I went to the various laboratories at the uh, Ballistic Research Laboratory where I designed warheads. In fact, I did the design and development work for the first Beaumont warhead there. Mm -hmm. 
I uh, had experience blowing up targets and all kinds of terminal ballistics and knowing what explosives will do and what they won't do. I moved on into the Air Force Systems Command. I was a commander of the Air Force Armament Technology Laboratory, which uh, mm. covered all that area for the Air Force. I was the first chairman of the, uh, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense of the Air Munitions Requirements and Development Committee, which was harmonizing the requirements for all air-delivered weapons for the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. So I spent 25 years uh, in all areas of uh, Air Force armament work and have had a lot of experience in uh, combat damage evaluation also. So I know what you can do with explosives, what you can't do. When I first looked at the, the reports coming out of Oklahoma, I knew that the truth was not coming out. The media was, uh, was very much confused or passing out disinformation, and I think some of the officials down there were putting out disinformation. And what was going on down there was totally uh, at odds with what I had uh, 25 years' experience of knowing. Okay. So I got all the information I could together and uh, took a look at it and ran some analyses, put the damage profiles on the building, and. And I concluded that there was a very high probability and a high level of confidence that were, there were demolition charges in the building. Uh, and I uh, wrote, I felt it was very important that the Senate and the House move to have an independent investigation in Oklahoma City because it needed to be established without question uh, whether and how many uh, demolition charges were in that building because it's an entirely different story if you had a bunch of demolition charges in the building in contradistinction to an ammonium nitrate truckload out in front of the building. General, could a truckload of ammonium nitrate in the configuration that the government says it was have done the damage to the building? Absolutely not. A general pardon. Let's say that uh, for argument, that bomb was professionally made, uh, it was fused right, timed right, everything was done as an expert's mission expert would have done it, just what would have been the damage to the building and would that have been possible if it was all correctly done with that truck bomb? Very light damage. General, with your background in explosives and munitions, uh, what's your speculation of what actually happened in Oklahoma City? I, I don't want to speculate. I want to tell you what happened. And as I said, I, I went to literally hundreds and hundreds of pictures that were covering uh, the removal of the debris uh, from the building site. And I was looking for those specific locations and the, and the columns at those specific locations where my analysis said you would have had to have had a demolition charge at. And uh, going through those as they were clearing the site, all those uh, demolition uh, charge positions were clearly revealed, clearly revealed. Now, for the television audience, I have a number of charts here, but I will talk through them and sure. people can understand what is being said. Sure. Uh, the, first, the first picture shows the, real the building down there just a few seconds before the blast. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see the cars, uh, the light poles, there's some aluminum, an aluminum light pole fairly close to it. And the next picture shows... Uh, it was taken about 35, 33 minutes after the uh, demolition, mm -hmm. and there's a little aluminum light pole that's over there very close to the building. It's still standing. The sign that was over here, the signs are gone, but the frame is still across the street. Uh, the frame, the pole that was on is gone, and you have this monstrous gapping side of the building removed. I don't care what was in the truck. It wasn't whether it was a high uh, energy military explosive or whether it was ammonium nitrate. Either case, you would not have had the energy to do to the building what was done, both from an order of magnitude as well as the pattern of destruction. <clears throat> okay. Now, for the benefit of the TV viewers, let me show a chart of the vertical profile of the building. This chart shows across the A row, A. Uh, the columns in red are knocked down. That was A2 through A8 are all down. Mm -hmm. And in the second row, column B3 is down. Mm -hmm. Before I knew precisely the location, and when I sent the letters to the Senate and the House, I put the truck bomb out where it was supposed to be, and I showed a sphere of ammonium nitrate about four feet in di four and a half feet in diameter, mm -hmm. with a pressure of a half a million pounds. By the time it reaches the first column, you're down below, uh, you're down around 2,000 pounds per square inch. 
by the time it reaches the second row of columns, you're, you're down around uh, somewhere between